Next up we have the non-organics. So that's going to be the bullets and the horseshoes. For this, it really just boils down to trying to build up the form slowly using smaller shapes. So in the horseshoe, you can see my progress here as I go from circles into semicircles, and then eventually all the way down to the finished horseshoe. There's a couple of things that make your life a lot easier as you're doing this. So the first I'd say is to turn off tiling and a lot of these transformation nodes. So you can see here, if I go to the tiling mode, normally this is set to relative to parent. And you can see that is not what I'm going to be looking for at all. By just clicking here, setting it to absolute, and turning this to no tiling, suddenly it's much easier to manipulate this shape. And if I click into our blend node, I can then move this around to wherever I want and start taking it out of the shape here. And I do that using a blend node using subtract. So if I'm looking to take anything away, I just use subtract. In this case here, I'm trying to add on, I'll use linear dodge or add. Um, the other really important thing when you're using these transformation nodes and trying to build up using smaller shapes is that you can see here, I've got two transformation nodes inputted into a blend. So in this case, I, this was going to be mirrored. So I wanted these to be in the exact same position on either side. But I only wanted to control one of them because I just I find it much easier if I'm controlling a smaller shape. So by taking one of these transformation nodes, plugging it into a second one, and then setting horizontal mirror. So by just clicking this, you can see it flips over and back. Suddenly, if I look at our blend node down here, I click on our transformation node and I start dragging this around. It's perfectly mirrored. That makes making adjustments, doing some fine tuning and some last minute tweaks, very, very easy. So you can see it just, it's a lot cleaner way of doing it and it makes your own life a bit easier, makes stuff simpler. After this, it goes through the same process of beveling and then using a levels node as we did previously with the stones. Uh, just to bring down those white levels, give it a softer edge. From here, I wanted to add some little holes to break up the very plain shape here. Uh, to do that, I just used a splatter circular node. So this creates a ring of, of, an, a, of a pattern. I've used bell as our pattern input. So this gives us a bit of a gradient, so it's not a very stark contrast between the two being cut into here. So we've got a little bit of a gradient to make it a bit softer. I've then given it a little bit of random scale. So you can see here scale randoms up a bit. That just, again, gives a bit of variation throughout the material. I've then fed it into a transformation 2D node. This is using the same values as I did back here, just so I'm sure it fits perfectly into these. Then feeding it into a blend node with subtract. Now, one thing I did is because I didn't want the holes to go all the way up to the tip of the horseshoe. I've just reused this blend node where we have the semicircle shape and I've plugged it into the mask to just make sure it doesn't affect these areas here. After this, we go through the same process of using slope alert grayscale to start chipping away on it. I've done one thing slightly differently then. I've used a blend node with multiply. Again, same pearl and noise that we've been using this the whole time. Using multiply instead of just increasing the value of the slope blur means that we are darkening down these chips a bit, but it's not warping the shape of our horseshoe. I wanted to keep this general shape. I just wanted to give a bit of surface noise to it and create a, some deeper dense into what's already there. When it comes to actually tiling this across the material and placing it in different places in the sand, I've used tile generator in this case. So what I've done with the tile generator is I've just set the X and Y input to six. So that just happened to be the shape or this made the size of the horseshoes that I was looking for personally. I've set the pattern input 
distribution to random. So these will just, if I wanted to add more things to this tile generator, it would randomly distribute them around. I've set up the rotation random to full. I've also set the luminance random up a bit. This just means that you can see here, this is significantly brighter than over here. It'll put them at different levels on the height map. So you can see this one's a bit higher than the one over here. Finally, I've set the random mask to be once again used by an exposed parameter. This one's very important, and I'll actually, I'll just cover a little bit of that now, I will cover it again later. Because I've got a second tile generator here, and they're both feeding into the one blend node. So what this is doing with the linear gradient feeding into the tile genera generator, it's using all the same settings. But what's happening with this is that when I use multiply in the blend node, I'm creating this gradient here. And by setting a different C to the random rotation, it'll put different sides of the horseshoe down in different areas. So if we look on this side here, the left hand side is being pushed into sand, whereas here it's the back. This just creates a bit more visual interest than having them sitting flat on top of the sand or having them all go be pushed into the sand at the same direction. The bullets in comparison now are a bit simpler. They're just using a rectangular shape uh, with a linear gradient using darken overlaid on top. This will start rounding it off a bit instead of it being just a flat shape. Uh, one thing I've done after this, after adding the linear gradient is to feed it through a curve node. So what this is doing here is it's bringing the white value down a little bit and just softening that gradient a bit. We want this to be round, but if we just plug this blend node straight up into the next blend node, ignoring the curve, you'll see it becomes a lot sharper and not what we're looking for. By using that curve node, we get this nice round shape. Creating this little bevel just past where the firing pin would be, it's very simple. We've just used another shape, use transform with Again, no tiling. We've brought it down to where we want it and we've put a bevel on it. Again, just soften those transitions a bit. And then we've blended it on top using subtract just to start darkening in this area just a little bit. You'd be surprised how much effect, especially at this scale, it has. So you can see here, it's gone down quite a bit even though it doesn't look like it up here. After this, we fed it into two different slope blur grayscales. Uh, the reason for this is, here is what I wanted it to affect the height of the material. But later on when I was doing the color mapping, I found that I wanted a bit more detail. But when I tried increasing the slope blur's intensity, I found it was too harsh for the um, for the height map. So I just I ended up going with two so that I can utilize that in the gradient map and I can use this when actually affecting the height. Blending all the height maps together is really where some of the organization I did earlier starts to come into play. So if we go down here and have a look at my height blend section, you can see I've used the red frame, the, the same red frames that I used on the uh, sand to represent the overall height blend. That's because the sand was the base for all of these different nodes. I'm blending things into the sand, so I want that to be clear from the frame out here. But what I've done inside of this is I've added extra frames. so. It, you can see here I've used the teal from the stones, the gold from the bullets, and the purple from the horseshoes. This lets me see at a glance which node is for which. I don't have to look into them, I don't have to try and remember which one's which, I don't need to follow these lines up to the other nodes. I can just check at a glance. The node I'm using to blend all these materials together is the height blend node. So if I click into that you can see some of the details of it. So you can see here I've got the height offset. So what this does is it actually changes the amount that the stones will be pushing through the sand. So if I bring this down, you'll start to see them disappear and push further into the sand. If I bring this all the way up, you'll start to see them poke out more. If we bring it up again, we're going to see something that's an issue I started to run into. 
or something I noticed at least is that if you start pushing the height blend too far you'll lose detail in the underlying map so in this case it's sand I mean it makes sense because it's trying to you can't increase the stones past white so it has to darken what's below it to try and give you the effect of them pushing through further but it is something to try to keep in mind when using this node is that you just need to be a bit careful about how you use it and try to preserve the detail in your underlying maps the reason that I chose to use these anyway and worked with the different values in it is that it gives me this height mask output so you can see here it's showing you what is outputting and gives you a nice crisp mask of it so if I want to use this somewhere else so for instance I've used it on my metallic map I've taken the height mask out of both the horseshoes and the bullets and I've blended those together and those act as my entire metallic map it's really clean it's a really easy way of using them I've also then used them to work on the color so by using this it's a, again a really simple way of showing where the color should be on the on the material so here you can see I'm using this this map here using that to blend the stones on here's the bullets you see the bullets that are the only ones getting the color and then again the same with the horseshoes <laughs> 